Dream Mission. Next day, we got the household goods packed. We piled on an eastbound train and left California. That ride for me was the saddest thing that has ever happened. I would look at those two and see that my wife was thinking my own thought. Even the little girl seemed to sense that all was not well. At Memphis, I almost casually bade them goodbye, and we parted. But as I watched their train disappear down the track, I knew that part of my life was gone. My world was grim. Reaching my assembly point for instructions, I found that I was reporting to Caldwell Caleb V. Haynes, one of the greatest of big ship pilots, the pilot in our Air Force who had devoted much of his life to making the four-engine bomber the weapon that it is today. The entire group of officers and men made quite a gathering. I learned that they were all picked men and that they had volunteered and almost fought for places on the crews of the fortresses. And as I heard the explanation of the flight from Colonel Haynes, I saw the reason for their excitement. This was a dream mission, one that was a million kinds of adventure rolled into one. We were to fly 13 four-engine bombers, one 624 and 12 BI-7Es to Asia. There we were to bomb up the ships after we had gone as far east as we possibly could, and then were to bomb objectives in Japan. Our orders read that we were to coordinate our attack from the west with another attack that was coining from the east. The sadness that had been with me since leaving my family vanished. Once again I saw the war in a spirit of adventure. Here was what any soldier might have prayed for. Here was what the American public had been clamoring for during the months since Pearl Harbor. I was fortunate to be one of the pilots. It almost made up for my failure to finally get into single-seater fighter ships again. Almost, but not quite. That night we talked things over and met each other and next morning we left for Washington with our newly drawn equipment. Our planes were in Florida, being made ready for combat, but we were obliged to go by way of Washington for the purpose, astounding in war, of securing diplomatic passports. I remember that even in the joy of the mission, I couldn't help wondering what kind of a war this one could be. We were having to secure passports in order to be able to fight. Visas were obtained for all countries we were to fly over and through Brazil, Liberia, Nigeria, Egypt, Arabia, India, and China, especially, visas to go to war, properly inoculated against 14 diseases, with visas for everywhere, with trinkets for trade with natives in Africa, Arabia, and Burma, we went on down to Florida. The instant I landed, I hunted out my ship, BI-7E Air Corps. I soon painted on its nose the red map of Japan, centered by the crosshairs of a modern bomb site, with the cross right over Tokyo. In my poor Latin was inscribed Hades ab altar, or roughly, hell from on high. I climbed into the control room of my ship and met my crew. Each man was a character. Each man wanted badly to get started. The co-pilot was Doug Sharp, another dark-haired southerner, a first lieutenant who was destined to get shot down in another flying fortress over Rangoon. He coolly got most of his crew out of the burning ship. Then... With those who were unable to parachute to safety, he landed the flaming ship in the rice paddies of central Burma. From this point, he led his men, those whom he did not have to bury beside the ship, out through the Japanese lines to safety in India. He was made a major after this gallant act. Doug was an ideal flying officer, and it was to him that I first turned for advice on how I should make myself acquainted with this big airplane. Doug had learned to fly at the period when I had been instructing. I had taught his class to fly. Now the tables were turned and he would have to be the instructor for a while. Don't forget that as yet, I hadn't flown a B-I-Y-E. Introducing myself to my co-pilot, I said, How about showing me how to fly this ship? I want to see how to work these turbos and such. He merely grinned at me in disbelief. Ah, oh, Colonel, he said, you can fly the thing. Why, you taught me to fly. I finally got him to give me some cockpit instruction by explaining that though I had many thousand hours in PTs, BTs, and other trainers, and knew lots about single-seaters and fast twin-engine medium bombers, I knew nothing about such planes as this big devil. He showed me the approved method of starting the four engines, when to use the booster switches, how to set the turbos, how to lock the tailwheel, and generally how to pick up that 57,000 pounds of flying dynamite and take it around the field. I flew it for two landings that afternoon, and that night I climbed all over the fortress 
read the entire maintenance manual, and learned from scratch what made the big ship go. Next day, I soloed it for over four hours, and after the twentieth landing, I felt as if I was ready to start for war. Then we tested everything, fired all guns at targets in the Everglades, and the cordite from all those roaring fifty calibers gave even the swampy glades a sweet aroma. My gunners were eager to be on the way, and I soon found that they knew exactly what they were doing. Private Motley was my tail gunner. During the entire trip, I think he stayed in the tail 90% of the time, just to gel used to the way to handle the tail turret. I used to say of Motley that he just didn't care where he was going. He wanted to see where he had been. Sergeant Altonen, the engineer, was charged with keeping the engines functioning properly. And in general, the entire enlisted personnel was under him. He was a diligent Finn and one of the bravest men I have ever seen. I can see Altonen now, standing there behind my seat and the co-pilot's seat, unperturbed in the roughest of storms, from the violent currents of the equatorial front of the Hamadans to the Shamals of Africa and Arabia, eternally watching the many instruments, waiting to correct the slightest trouble, even before it happened. When we were lost over trackless seas, he was never ruffled, but ready at all times with information as to fuel consumption and the best RPMs for cruising. Once when he was told that we would probably have to land in the Atlantic, there was no change in the expression on his face. He simply began to move the provisions to a point where they could be quickly placed in the rubber boats. His job in case of attack was to man the top turret with its twin fifties. Sergeant Baldbridge was the head radio man. His secondary duty was to handle one of the waste guns back aft of midships. Corporal Cobb was second radio man. He would leave that to enter the lower turret. The other waste gun on this flight was to be handled by a radio officer, Lieutenant Hershey. The navigator was a lieutenant whom 111 called Jack. He was a nervy kid who liked his job. I know that after our mission, he made many raids as navigator to bomb the Japs in Rangoon. We tested the Bombardier and the BPMB site, too, before we started the flight. Lean, lanky, six-foot-three Bombardier George. I never did see how he managed to wiggle into the nose of the fortress. I can see him there now, tense over his sight, waiting for the bombs to go, ever with the crosshairs on the target. George had a couple of fifty caliber guns up there in the nose with him, too. He was just the opposite of the tail gunner. He never did know where he had been, but always got there first. And so the eight of them made up my crew, eight good soldiers who had volunteered and who wanted to hurt the enemy. None of them worried about whether or not he'd get home, for he knew of bigger things that had to be done. We had to test everything, for it was over 16,000 miles to Japan the way we were having to go. There couldn't be a slip-up on this mission, and so we didn't take a chance. When finally all was set, I was about nervous enough to bite my nails off, for my ship was to be last to leave the States. I had worried every minute of the time we had been waiting for fear that some brass hat would get my orders changed before I could get on my way. The other twelve ships had gone, with Colonel Haynes leading in his six to twenty-four. They all made their way to the east separately, with instructions to meet in Karachi, India, for final orders, and Karachi was twelve thousand miles away. As soon as we could leave the west coast of Florida, we loaded up and crossed the state. Going on east over West Palm Beach, I rang the alarm bell, putting all men on the alert, and we dropped down, with the crew firing at the whitecaps out over the Gulf Stream. The guns were working fine, but we couldn't take a chance. I had to learn right now whether the crew could work as a team, for once we started it would be too late. As we came back towards the last field we were to land on in the USA, Something strange met my sight, something that made the blood pound a little harder in my temples. There, along the entire beach of Florida, was a jagged black line. The clean sand of Florida's beaches had been made black and terrible-looking by the oil from many tankers sunk by the Axis submarine war. It gave me a queer feeling, for along the beaches there was also the beached wreckage of several ships. This war was meaning more and more to us as we prepared to shove off for the first stop out of America. Now we were poised for our flight to Puerto Rico. In our two-day wait for technical changes on the engines, I worried more than ever, for the other twelve ships were gone and I was getting frantic lest something might change the orders.
Finally, after having to wait during days of perfect weather, we took off in heavy rain for Borinquen Field, PR. The takeoff and first two hours of the flight were instrument as we were flying through a moderate tropical front. We finally broke into clearing weather over Long Island Key, British West Indies. This was on March 31, 1942. Just after noon, we sighted Hispaniola at the point of Cape Francis Viejo. Sergeant Altonen passed out some hot coffee from the thermos jugs. Our spirits were high, for now that we had passed the bad weather, this was like a picnic. The big ship was handling like a single cedar. We turned from the dark, mysterious Hispaniola, crossed Mona Passage, and landed at Barinquin Field at 1507, just three minutes off our ETA. Two of our flight's fortresses were waiting in Puerto Rico for minor repairs, so we felt a little less lonesome. Just in case the authorities in Washington decided to stop the last ship or the last two ships in our mission, I got my crew up long before daylight next morning, and we soon were heading south for Trinidad, ahead of the other two. The weather was perfect, with scattered clouds and a light tailwind, and we flew low, looking for enemy submarines. Thirty miles west of Martinique we thought we saw one, but could not verify. We passed over the Grenadines near St. George, Grenada, and soon saw the hills of Trinidad rising out of the Caribbean. With our ship serviced and ready for a very early morning takeoff, we now took the most dangerous ride we experienced on the trip. This was a trip into Port of Spain in a combat car. It seemed to me that the natives just waited in side roads to try and run into us, in blind areas, where we could not see them. Besides, it has always seemed to me that drivers who take pilots from their ships into towns religiously try to show them how to turn corners on one wheel and to show that they can easily drive into said town at the same average speed that the pilot could fly. In the city, we picked up a case of scotch for medicinal purposes, the purifying of water and snake bites. We joked about the recipes on the way back. I recommended one cup of scotch to a jigger of water. It works. A real night takeoff from Trinidad, we were airborne in the darkness at 5.20 a.m. As the wheels left the ground, I realized very quickly how great a load we were lifting. This was the first time we had taken off with full load of fuel, and it seemed to me that I almost had to break my arms to keep the tail from going all the way back to the jungle. For all practical purposes, the fortress tried a loop. Finally, we got the ship rigged properly and climbed on top of the clouds at 8,000 feet. Later, we had to go higher to keep from going through the heavy tropical thunderheads. With our overload, neither Doug nor I wanted to risk the turbulence that we knew was there. As the sun came up, we could look down through holes at intervals and see the dark Atlantic near the Guianas. There was a thick tropical haze from the base of the clouds down to the water, giving it all an eerie appearance. Later on, through the breaks, I saw the mouth of a big river emptying northeast into the sea. It was the Rio Moroni, which divides French and Dutch Guiana, and it reminded me that in 1937 I had made a flight up this same jungle stream, looking in vain for the lost pilot, Paul Redfern. Over Devil's Island at 9.20, I saw by our chart that we were only five degrees north of the equator. Coming down lower to look at the French penal colony, we found that although the temperature was comfortable on top of the haze at 6,000 feet, down in the soup near the water, we had difficulty breathing. Passing on over another river identified as the Rio Oyapoque, we went out of the Guianas into Brazil at 9.55 a.m., cruising low. It must have been that case of scotch added suddenly to the other 60,000 pounds. At 800 feet, we got some unforgettable views of the steaming Brazilian jungle. Looking out to sea, we noticed that the blue color already was changing to the murkiness of the Amazon though we were about a hundred miles from its mouth. Flying low, I noted that the hump of Brazil near the coast was flat and green and hot as hell. Temperature 96 and humidity about 99% at 10.55 a.m. We reached the mouth of the greatest river in the world at 1135 EWT. Here, the width of the Amazon is about 150 miles. Boys will have their fun too, no matter if you are flying low over the greatest of rivers. As we crossed the equator, old zero degrees lat, at 11.56 a.m., at west longitude 49 degrees 32 minutes, 
I saw those of my crew who had been in the south latitudes before take paper cups of water and drop them on the heads of those who were uninitiated, thus making them subjects of the sacred realm of Jupiter Rex as identified from the realm of Neptune Rex on the sea. We crossed the Amazon from just west of Point Grossa over Bahia Santa Rosa to Mixiana Island, thence to Isla de Marajo. This last island in the mouth of the river is 100 miles wide and reputedly has more cattle on the single ranch than any other ranch in the world. Soon we came to Rio Para, crossed it in a thunderstorm, and were over Bellum, where we landed in the blackness of a tropical rain at 12.40 EWT. On April 4th, we left Belem for Natal at 6.55 a.m. and climbed to 10,000 feet in order to top as much of the cumulus as possible. We had to skirt one great anvil head, reaching up into the substratosphere near Bam San Luis. This storm covered about 50 miles, but we got around it without going into its turbulence. As we went on south of the equator, the haze diminished gradually and the country became dry, making us think we were over western Texas. We landed at Natal, our jump-off point far the South Atlantic crossing, at 12.25 EWT. This was to be a real day's flight, for we were not to be able to spend the night at Natal. Our run from Belem to Natal of 900 miles, then the crossing of 1,900 miles to Liberia, plus the run down the hump of Africa to a Pan American base on the Gold Coast, this last almost 900 miles, had to be made without stops except short ones for fuel. For all practical purposes, then, we had 3,700 miles to make in one day. We got the big ship serviced and ready for the trip, then went to the Ferry Command Hotel. There we found two more crews of our 13 heavy bombers. One group of these had turned back the night before with one engine out. The other, piloted by Collar and Jerry Mason, had nearly come to grief on the way in from Bellum. The rubber life rafts in the forts are carried in two compartments, where the wing of the 817 joins the big fuselage. This is to facilitate their automatic release upon contact with the water should the ship have to land at sea. They are, of course, tied to the airplane with strong manila rope, and it is on this hemp that the present tale hangs. In the flight down the coast, some malfunction had caused one of these compartments to spring open, and out came the heavy five-man boat. At the speed of 200 miles an hour, with which it struck the tail section as it went back on its rope in the slipstream of two engines, it nearly took the entire horizontal stabilizer off. Only by very skillful piloting had Jerry Mason managed to get the fort and his crew of ten to Natal. Just the same, in my attempted nap that afternoon I grinned at the thought that we and old Hades Ab Alter were passing ahead of two more ships of the flight. Boy, I dreamed, they'll have a hell of a job getting me back there into the training center now. It's four thousand miles back to Florida, and in the morning I'll be across the Atlantic. But I was to find, before we got to Africa, that many slips can develop. Things had been going very smoothly, but fate was deciding to test me and my crew on the run across the South Atlantic. We waited until darkness for the takeoff to ensure our arrival on the west coast of Africa in the light of early morning. At six o'clock, local time, we went to the field. That evening I had tried to eat, but the more I chewed the food, the more it stuck in my throat. Nervousness, anticipation, I don't know which. But even this place, far down in South America, was tied on to North America and my home in Georgia, by the narrow lands of Central America. In a pinch, one could still walk back home from here, but after this hop across an ocean, all that would change. On the drive to the airport, I talked casually to the entire crew. They were all anxious to get into the air and get on with our mission, but from their answers, I knew they were thinking as I thought. One person whose confidence I was especially trying to get was my navigator. I told him that I had been flying over ten years, and that was a pretty long time considering. I tried to make him see that even in those ten years things and conditions had changed. I always navigated by dead reckoning. That is, I drew a course and followed that compass course with corrections from deviation and variation. Then, as I flew along, I passed over certain known places we called checkpoints and on to my destination. Of course, out over the oceans, there would be no checkpoints. But even without them, it would have been possible in many cases to fly a ship 
with just a compass course corrected from South America to Africa. Nevertheless, the best way was by means of celestial navigation, and that, I told Jack the Navigator, was where he fitted into the picture. I tried to impress on him the realization that I was going to have explicit confidence in his navigation, for I knew in many cases that older pilots are hard to change from dead reckoners to the more modern and efficient method. Jack took the talk well, worked hard over his charts, and told me the initial course was 81 degrees. This would change slightly from drift, from the wind, and as we made a great circle. We all knew that this ship had to get safely to the battle zone. We all knew that it would take all of us functioning as a team to get it there. On this navigator rested the responsibility of taking the ship either to some spot lost in the sea or to an infinitesimal point on the west coast of Africa. Our goal. I got aboard last, going through the fuselage door in the rear of the ship. Each man as I passed appeared lighthearted, but I knew that was the American way of facing adventure. As I talked to them one by one, I would notice that after replying, each man's eyes would turn towards the door through which I had come. It was as though each man knew that when that aluminum door closed, it would close for months, years, or maybe forever on the world in which he had lived. Each man may have been wondering how many of the men in this ship would ever get back. He was perhaps wondering if this great weapon, before it was worn out, lost or destroyed, would do enough damage against the enemy to compensate for its loss. The door closed at my order. I crawled under the top turret after sidestepping through the narrow beams of the bomb bay. I slid into the left-hand seat. Sergeant Altman was at his place behind Doug and me. I nodded to the co-pilot, and he started the four engines. As the roar and vibrations came from our power plants, I could feel the thousands of impulses through the throttles. They seemed to flow up my arm to my body. The ship seemed alive. A light rain was falling. We taxied down for takeoff practically by instrument, for even on a clear night it's almost impossible to taxi visually, and the rain on the windshields plus the lights from the cockpit made everything fuzzy. Our world was the cockpit. All else was invisible and unreal. With the turbo set we gave the fortress the needles and took off towards the sea. As I felt the big wheels draw up into their wells, I heard Jack the Navigator say, Off at 10.03 GMT. All about was darkness. I didn't even see the beach as we went over it, and I was momentarily disappointed at missing my last possible glimpse of the Western Hemisphere. Just the same, we'd gotten off with a load of nearly 60,000 pounds and were rolling towards Africa. I felt my face crack into a grin. I nudged Doug and yelled, They can't get me back to the training center now! And I pulled my radio plug free from my headset. This was enough for Doug. He got it. Cut off from the world by merely disconnecting my radio headset. We laughed. We climbed on up through the ram and broke out into the clear sky and the millions of stars at 11,000 feet. No one but an airman will ever realize what it means to climb out of a storm and see the friendly stars. I felt as though the millstones of anxiety had fallen off in the confidence that mounted in me, and I called for coffee. The engineer passed it up to me. I drank the second cup as the moon rose out of the white clouds at 1-1 GMT. Down below I could see the navigator's dome light going on and off as he took his shots of the stars. Jack was beginning his long job, which would end only when we got a definite fix on the west coast of Africa. Then he'd put away his navigation instruments, pencils and charts, and come to stand behind our seats and watch for the landfall that he'd foretold. Then he'd see if the ETA was as he had predicted. The miles lengthened out behind us, as we kept a course very little changed from the one we'd started with. In four hours, the navigator told me we'd made 700 miles. That was all right, considering the climb and the fact that we had the headwind ever-present in an easterly crossing over the South Atlantic. Down below the clouds were broken, beautiful in the light of the full moon that was climbing fast as we went towards it. Every now and then we'd bump through the tops of higher cumulus clouds. Far up ahead and coming closer were winking flashes that I knew were the lightning of the almost stationary equatorial front. We'd been told about this equatorial front in our pilot's briefing in Florida. The advice was to fly our computed course until the approach to the equator placed us within the rough area of this front, which moved very slowly between four degrees north of zero degrees latitude and about the same number of degrees south. 
Then, as this front stretched from east to west and our course was very nearly parallel to it, we were advised upon reaching it to turn almost 90 degrees to the left, which would be north. Thus, by flying for a very short time perpendicular to the front, we'd be through it. After crossing the front, we were to turn back to the normal course. The flashes of lightning ahead drew closer and closer. I could see the heavy black storm clouds now, and I couldn't help tensing up, for after all, the instructions we had for evading the turbulence were based on theory, and PD seen theories tumble before. The air grew rougher as we moved in on the front. The lightning looked like a fireworks display at Coney Island viewed from far away. At first we went into the tops of whitish-gray clouds, and then burst out again into the light of the moon. Finally, the clouds seemed to be growing in size and rising. As the light of the moon grew less, I could see the cumulonimbus thunderheads boiling as if they were steam escaping from a cauldron. Then we went into them and didn't come out. I held the course steady, for I knew we were now entering the solid wall of the front, the point where two air masses of greatly different temperatures have met. As the flashes of lightning crackled down through the dark clouds, I'd try to turn away from the blue streaks. Suddenly there came a real thrill. As the lightning played about us, the wingtips appeared to glow a dull blue. About the whirling propellers was the same blue fire, and as I reached out towards the instrument board to take the ship off the automatic pilot, the space between my hand and the board glowed with a soft blue. Then I remembered what this phenomenon was. St. Elmo's fire, caused by special conditions of static electricity. The eerie sight recurred periodically, but I never did become used to it. How can you, when you are riding along with practically a railroad tank car of 100-octane aviation gasoline and the little gremlins are running around with torches of high-priority blue flame? As I settled myself on instruments, hand-flying the ship, the turbulence increased, and I remembered the instructions to turn to the north. As I went into the turn, it seemed that all hell broke loose. I must have entered the center of the storm just at the instant of turning. The violent updrafts would clutch the big ship, and we'd go kiting up like an elevator. At first, I'd tried desperately to hold the altitude constant, but it was to no avail. The ship would be flying straight and level, but we'd be climbing 2,500 to 3,500 feet per minute. Then, just as suddenly, we'd hurtle through the updraft into a downdraft, and it would seem as if the wings were going to be torn from the fuselage. Down we'd go at the same indicated speed that we'd come up. Looking out the side glasses, I could see the aluminum skin of the big fortress wing shimmering in the lightning as the very metal wrinkled under the heavy stresses the ship was undergoing. I got the gyro set and headed north, hoping to get out of the turbulence. Doug had to help me. He'd keep the gyro on zero with the rudder, and I'd hold the altitude of the ship level with the wheel. It seemed that the clouds were endless and that each new center in the front was rougher than the last. Perhaps this front reached all the way to the North Pole. After begun to think so, anyway. And then, with one final shake of the fortress, like a giant dog shaking a pup, the elements threw us out from the hills and valleys of the front, and we saw the moon and the stars again. Once more came the feeling of exhilaration. We got the ship back on course for Africa. Off to our right in the south, the lightning continued to play. If we hadn't turned as the briefing pilots had advised, that flight through the front would have shaken us for another hour or longer. We had gone through in a few minutes, but under the tension time had seemed to drag out for endless hours. As confidence surged back, with better weather indicated, I could relax again, and Sergeant Altman passed me another cup of coffee. The world was good again, worth living in, and somewhere out there far ahead was Africa. The radio man called to us to listen on the command set that the music from Rio was hot as hell. I switched over to the big set, and as we passed over the very center of the Atlantic, I did very gentle turns with the big ship, as if it were essing in rhythm with the jazz. Jack gave me another fix, and said we were halfway across. Tiki engineer checked the fuel consumption, for it was up to him to give me the go-ahead, or the turnback signal. He also checked the engines with Doug and me, we had reached what we called in pilot's lingo the point of no return. You see, from here on, it would be farther back to South America than on to Africa.
I remember feeling very glad that we didn't have to worry about going back through that front. All about us now, the night was beautiful. The moon had got back over behind us in the west. I could hear part of old Kipling's Ballad of East and West, keeping time with the steady roar of the engines. We've ridden the low moon out of the sky. Outside, I looked at the props shimmering in the moonlight and could not help marveling at how modern engineering had perfected such engines. I thought of the millions and millions of revolutions those propellers had made and how many more they had to go, how many billions of times the spark plugs had fired. And still, after years of flying, I could not quite understand what held such weights as this ship in the air. Down below in the breaks now we could see the moonlight on the water. The hours went by and the miles went astern, and I began to let slowly down, for the sky was beginning to turn gray ahead. It's a short night when you travel east towards the sun at over 200 miles per hour. We had been cautioned to let down early in our approach to the African coast, for there are usually clouds and always a dense haze. To continue on too far would place us over the hills of the interior and would complicate our arrival at destination. As the dawn of April 5th came, we continued going downhill, from 11,000 feet to 1,000. At this low altitude, we skated along over the calm sea, looking ahead for land with anxious eyes, for after nearly 2,000 statute miles of ocean flying, we were tired. We knew we must be two or three hundred miles offshore still, but we were eager to glimpse the dark continent. I could see all the crew pressing up from the rear of the ship trying to get up with us. We were all peering through the windshields, each wanting to be the first to cry, Land ho! But the cry didn't come, and we kept flying our course down close to the water. Then something queer happened. We had been flying approximately 81 degrees all night, but suddenly the navigator called on the interphone and said, Change course to 135 degrees. At that time I was munching a sandwich, and boys, I nearly dropped it. I know the piece that I was chewing got bigger and bigger, for I finally had to wash it down with the Swedish coffee that had been fixed for us in Natal. I looked over at the co-pilot, and he had heard the new course and appeared puzzled too. I looked down at the sea, wondering why in hell we were making such a radical change in direction. Then, just as suddenly, I remembered that I had told this navigator that I was going to go by what he said. So I changed to a 135 course. The ship rolled on just about 1,000 feet off the water. Both Doug and I just forgot all about food. We settled in our seats thinking, now maybe this is something else. And then I thought, this is a sun line he's trying to get. Oh, yes, a sun line. And then I remembered the sun wasn't up. How could anybody be shooting a sun line when the sun hadn't risen? But we went on that way for 30 minutes while Doug and I anxiously waited for the navigator to tell us another course to fly. When he did tell us it was some other crazy change, 145 degrees or something, and I said, Doug, you take it a minute. I'm going down and see what's the matter here. I went down into the navigator's compartment. Look here, Jack, I said. We've been doing all right. We ought to hit Africa in about an hour, and we suddenly make a radical change of about 90 degrees. What's the matter? He looked a bit worried. Then I remembered that I had seen his lights go on and off all night and also that he had seemed a little nervous about what he was doing. Jack frowned and said, Well, Colonel, I don't know. I distinctly choked before I was able to ask, What do you mean you don't know? And the terrible fear that came to me was like this. Here we were in a wonderful ship with nine men supposed to be trained as a team and on the way to war. How could we afford to lose something like that in the Atlantic? I didn't think about losing our lives or having to float about on the Atlantic in a rubber boat for days and days, and I know that none of those men would have thought about that. I thought about the ship we were supposed to take to war, and I looked back at Jack and said, What did you do? What are you doing? We've been flying a straight course. I made a mistake, said Jack, when I set my watches last night in flight after we took off. Now the watches that you set on a ship that you are navigating celestially are your chronometers, and they are, of course, very sensitive. There were two of them, and Jack went on to tell me that while he'd been listening to Rio during the night, the radio had given the time, and he had tried to set the two watches. But he had made the mistake of forgetting to pull out the stem on one immediately. At any rate, there was a difference of a few seconds in the time he had and the time it was supposed to be, and even those few seconds, he felt, 
had thrown us off course. Well, I didn't know what to do. I went on back to the left-hand seat in that flying fortress, and I think I staggered a bit. I know I stared out of the window and didn't know what to say. Then I told Doug about it. We kind of cussed, and I remember saying, Damn of, Doug, I've always been a dead reckoning pilot. Africa's a big place. I think I could have hit it by pilotage alone, just by pointing the ship at the bulge of the continent and flying straight. I might have missed the field that I aimed for by a few miles. But I would have intentionally headed so far south or so far north of the point that I'd have known which way to turn when I'd got to Africa. And now we've let a kid navigator lose us out here. I felt like crying. I could feel the tears in my eyes. I looked down at the water of the Atlantic, black below the clouds that we were flying under. Sometime soon, if we weren't on the right course, we were going to have to land in that water. And now that thought began to worry me too. Very few land-based airplanes, and the Flying Fortress, of course, was one of those not intended to land on water, had ever landed in the sea without injuring some of the crew. A few minutes later, Jack frantically called up another course to fly, and I changed to it, not knowing what else to do. Then I came to a decision. If we had been on the course when we had been flying 81 degrees, and we must assume that we had been on the course, I was going to turn back now to that original heading. I told the co-pilot to go down and bring the chart up. We'd take a look at it. Pretty soon, Doug came back from the navigator's room with the chart of Africa's west coast. Now, if you'll look at the coast of Africa on the western side, you'll note that we were heading for the big bulge north of the equator that stretches from up north of Bathurst, south and east, towards Lagos. Well... I took a ruler and drew a line from Bathurst down through Accra. I drew a perpendicular bisecting that line and assumed that we were out in the Atlantic on that bisector. When you're lost, you've got to assume something definitely. Then I measured the angle of that line high toward Africa and found it to be 60 degrees. Looking over at Doug Sharp, I said, Well, Doug, there's only one thing, and I'm going to do it. If I'd been flying two or three hundred hours, I might start searching around out here for land. I'm not going to do that. I've been flying long enough to know that the only way to get any place is to fly in a straight line, and that's the way we're going to fly. I set my gyro on that 60-degree course, called down to the bombardier, that T-A-H, lanky bombardier named George, and told him to get set and turn it over to the AFCE. It would be a straight course now, for that was our only hope. Then I looked around to see if I couldn't build up a little morale among the crew, most of whom had gathered up forward. They sensed what was wrong. The radio man was back there now, trying to get a radio bearing on Bathurst, and some of the others were trying to get another place. I smiled at them all, and I said, If any of you try to take it off this course, I'm going to hit you over the head with this gun. And even with the smile they knew, and I knew, that I meant it. We might have to paddle around to get to Africa, but we were going to know just about where to head for land. The farthest we could have been from the hump of Africa was around two or three hours flying time. Giving the elements the benefit of the doubt, giving us in fact the worst of everything, I knew that three hours would tell the story. I looked over at the co-pilot again and asked him, what was the best thing to do? Throttle the engines far back to save fuel, or go on as we were? Throttle them back, he said. I asked him then if it would be best to cut off some of the engines, and he advised doing it later. Maybe we could try one and later cut two. We went down as low as 500 feet to be able to see under the clouds. As we watched, we flew into more rain. At first, that made me feel good. We're getting close to land, I thought. It's raining, and it's always raining around Africa. Just the mind making me think what I wanted to think. That was all. Then I saw a freighter down below, and by studying the direction in which the wake pointed, I tried to figure out where it had come from. We swung around it so that we wouldn't scare the crew, and also so that they wouldn't be tempted to shoot at us. I could just imagine those sailors down there having pretty itchy fingers, especially when four-engine bombers passed over far out to sea, an hour passed. I looked at the fuel gauges, pulled back on the throttles a little more, and further reduce the manifold pressure in order to use less gasoline. We were now indicating about 165 miles an hour. 
I felt my throat kind of choke up. Looking at the other men, I know their thoughts were about the same as mine. The one that I pitied most was the poor boy down below who was the navigator. He had made a mistake, but all of us have made mistakes. I would be aware of hating him one minute, then of being sorry for him the next. But we held to that course of sixty degrees, and I reached the state of looking in any direction and seeing the land of islands that I knew weren't there. Low clouds on the water would appear to be islands. Everywhere we looked there was land, but we kept going straight ahead. I knew what mirages were, and we were not going to roam in circles over that ocean until we ran out of gas and didn't know where we were. I thought constantly of this expensive plane ready with bristling guns to blast the Japs. But whenever I shut my eyes to rest them, I would see it slowly sinking in the water, no good to anybody. I mechanically eases back on the throttle some more, and another hour went by. I looked over and checked the fuel gauges again, and the co-pilot said calmly, Well, Colonel, we can stay in the air about two hours more. We have to get there in two hours. I don't know whether I throttled back more then or not. By that time, we were flying just fast enough to keep the big ship in the air. The minutes dragged by, and every time I looked at the fuel gauges, they seemed to be going towards the empty marks so fast that I thought there must be holes in the tanks. Two hours and fifty-five minutes from the time that we had begun to doubt ourselves, something lurched through the rain clouds. At first it looked like a big black funnel, and I grabbed the controls and prepared to turn out of the way, for this was the latitude of water spouts. Then with a start I recognized, or thought I recognized, the object. This time, it looked like real land. I felt the goose flesh of excitement break out all over me, a shiver of pure thanksgiving run down my spine. For I could see trees on the black object, and I knew there were no trees on water spouts. It was a hill, and this was Africa. I could have kissed that hill. I could have reached out my arms and hugged that ragged hill. Land ho! We didn't know exactly what part of the country it was, and it didn't much matter. I heard the loudest yells I've ever heard in my life. Doug let out one, and then Sergeant Altonen behind him. I even heard the navigator cheering. I felt like looping the ship, and it wouldn't have been very difficult to do with the light gas load we were carrying. I looked at the chart of Africa, and at the area we were probably over. The contours showed only two outstanding hills along the coast from a hundred miles north of our destination to a hundred miles south. There was one near Freetown, about 835 feet above sea level, and there was one at Fisher's Lake, Liberia. Here the mark indicated nearly 400 feet above sea level. It seemed too good to be true that we could have hit Fisher's Lake, Liberia, for that is very near the point we were heading for. There was a quick way to check on that. I dove down about a hundred feet. We went over the hill, and we were slightly over 400 feet. And then I said, This, I believe, is Fisher's Lake. If it is, we're just too good or we're too lucky or somebody has taken us by the hand and brought us in here. But there's another check we can use. The town is supposed to be over there to the left. So we circled over, and there was a town right where it showed on the map. I felt better and better. Confidence was beginning to grow within me, even if we did have less than one hour's fuel remaining. Then the possibility of another check occurred to me. Two nights earlier, a classmate of mine had left Natal piloting one of the 8175 in our flight. Reaching Africa too early in the morning, he had encountered thick haze, and rather than mill around and run out of gas, he had set down on a level beach. The radio that had come back from that ship via the Army radio at our destination had stated that this officer had gotten down safely at Fisher's Lake, Liberia. With the help of the natives, he had pulled the plane back along the sand, letting out part of the air from his big tires to make them sink less deeply into the sand. Later in the day, he had taken off and flown to destination. The last test, then, would be to go down low and look for the marks of this other fortress's wheels in the sand. As I dove over the long beach near Robertsport, I saw them long before I expected them. They were distinct and I could even see the doth markers that Colin Torgel's Vold had got the natives to put up on sticks so that he could steer down the beach for the difficult takeoff. I yelled again, for this had absolutely identified our position. 
We were only minutes from our goal. Something else impressed itself upon me here, something that I shall think about many times in the years to come. I remembered a night long ago, when we were carrying the airmail through the snow and ice of the Great Lakes region, the night when I had been lost in a bomber loaded with mail. I have told how, finding myself on the Kalamazoo Chicago lane of lighted beacons, I had finally got down on the proper course and had landed at what I hoped and prayed was Toledo. I've told how, to avoid giving myself away, I asked the sergeant a question about a friend of mine at the Toledo field. That man had been Lieutenant Wold, the same man who as Colonel Wold had made the forced landing on the beach at Fisher's Lake. Coincidence? Accident? I don't know. Many years had gone by, the world had changed greatly, and yet at this point, halfway around the globe, the same man had enabled me once again to locate my position. No one can imagine the thrill of relief that ran through all our crew of nine as I turned that ship southeast for the short run to our landing field. We had been out in the ocean in such a position that if we had flown a wrong course, such as the course of the 90-degree change that we had made, we might easily have paralleled the coast below the bulge of West Africa for some 1,200 miles, finally running out of fuel far out to sea, knowing only that any land would be roughly northeast or east. Now I took the ship down so low on the water that the props were almost touching the waves. We moved the throttles back to normal cruising position and hedgehopped the beach. I dipped the wings in between the palm trees. I dove at people sleeping in front of their huts. I waved at them and they waved back. A feeling of friendliness came over me as I saw the flash of their smiles. At that minute, we loved everybody. All of us felt too good. All that crew knew we'd had a close squeeze, and now the tension was off. This great ship was still intact, ready to strike at the enemy, and not back there somewhere in the Atlantic, sinking. There weren't two rubber boats floating around with nine of us in them. Good combat men, perhaps, now broken in body by an ocean crash. I was the pilot of that ship. The ship's loss would not have been my fault any more than it would have been the fault of the tail gunner or the radio man. It was the navigator who had lost us for I had trusted him all the way until the trouble. Just the same, I knew that the pilot was the man upon whom the responsibility would rest, and in this moment I was bound to be the happiest in the crew. Dawn in front appeared the river that led into the field. We followed the corridor, that mythical line that we had to fly exactly in order to identify ourselves. Now there was the field, thousands of natives working on the long runway, pulling stone rollers and carrying small baskets of earth on their heads. I yielded to another childish temptation and dove to buzz the airdrome. In a dive just like a single-seater's, I pulled up at some three hundred miles an hour and shandelled off the runway as the native workers got out of the way. I almost looped the next pass, then slipped into a landing on our first stop in Africa.